in any case. So rhetoric. Rhetoric is the skill of phrasing things in such a way that makes people think that what you're saying is important and significant, even if you're talking nonsense. The basic point here is that we as audience members often listen more to the style of something than the substance of something. That if something is put together in the right way, using the right types of phrases and delivered in the right way, we will believe that it is significant and important and true, even if it is none of those things. This is how politicians are able to do things. I think we would all agree that there are a great many politicians in the world who are idiots. Um, I'm the one running side. Right, excuse me, folks. Uh, we don't need to discuss which or which, but I think we can all agree on that. And yet they manage to get elected. They manage to raise millions and millions of dollars. And it's because most politicians are very, very good at the idea of rhetoric, about how to shape ideas as you deliver them to make them sound appealing. Luckily, <clears throat> there are just a few tools of rhetoric um, that you need to know. I'm going to talk about the big ones. Now, in truth, there are many, many types of rhetoric, um, but we're going to talk about the big ones here. The first one is something you've already talked about in your English classes. <coughs> Um, and you may have thought it was just a boring thing to talk about in your English classes, but in fact, it's the backbone of rhetoric. Um, and it is the thesis, support, summation structure. What, when you've done your five paragraph format in English, that's what this is. You take a moment to establish your thesis. Thesis is just, it just means idea. It's what you're trying to prove. Okay. Then you have some support, usually three points of support. We'll talk about why three in a moment. And then you, you summarize, you wrap it up at the end. That's how you do a five paragraph essay in English. Uh, it's how you typically do most reports and that kind of thing. Uh, Gina, if you can give me your full attention, please. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and importantly, it's how you deliver an idea to a, a listening audience to get your point across. First you say, this is what I want, or this is what I should do, you should do. And then you have points of fact to support it, and then you return to, this is what you should do. The summation is always a repetition in some fashion of the thesis. So for example, um, thesis. You should elect me as evil overlord. Um, points of support. If you do it, I'll give you candy. Yes. Second point of support. That doesn't sound like an evil overlord. Well, okay. Second point. If you do it, I will murder your enemies. Yes. yes. So third point of, of support. My face would look really good on the evil overlord t-shirts. No. Uh, <laughs> okay. You don't want to end up on the enemies list. Yeah. Um, and then summation, and that is why I would like you to choose me as evil overlord. So again, very, very simple, but it has that same structure. What you want, reasons why, going back to that. Every good speech has some variation of that, and then there can be some variations. Um, now we get, after we talk about structure, we get into the actual tools of rhetoric. And the big one is called the rule of three. Now, we have been talking about the number three a lot in this class. Three is a magic number. Three is a magic number. They said so in Schoolhouse Rocks, therefore it must be true. We talk about in um, composition, we talked about the rule of thirds. Um, we also talked in lighting about key, fill, and top light on your person. And we call that three-point lighting. The rule of three is neither of these things, so please don't get confused about what has to do with composition and lighting. The rule of three has to do with writing. And it's really important whether you're writing serious stuff or whether you're writing comedy. In comedy, it is hugely important. When we talk about comedy, we'll spend a lot of time talking about rule of three. But it's a rhetorical device as well. And the reason for this is the human brain works in patterns of three. It's just the way we're wired. We observe, we test, we prove. And that's just the way that we exist through life. There's a pattern three that underlies much of what we do. So basically, any time you are making a point, um, any time you are trying to, to prove something, you want to do it three times. 
three variations on a theme. Um, uh, I went to the people and I asked them this, and I went to the government and I asked them this, and now I'm coming to you and asking this. One, two, three. Uh, and the point is that even if what you're saying is, is sort of useless, if you've got that three-part structure, it's going to sound impressive. Um, the next part is what we call parallel structure. This goes together. Parallelism. Parallelism just means that you're using the same grammatical structure each time. You're repeating a grammatical structure. Um, I've been to the people, and I've been to the government, and now I'm coming to you. It uses that same been, been, coming. Um, that same kind of grammatical structure. I'm trying to think of another. Um, uh, there's a, a very famous speech by Winston Churchill. We will fight uh, on the uh, what, we will fight on the beachheads. We will fight. On the, in the trenches, we will fight in the fields, and, and, and just repeating that idea, we will fight X, we will fight there. The other famous one, of course, comes not from Winston Churchill, but Dr. Seuss. I will not eat them in a box, I will not eat them with a fox, I will not eat them on a train, I will not eat them in the rain, I will not eat green eggs and ham, I will not eat them Sam I am. Um, so that's what we mean by parallel structure. It uses the same grammatical structure over and over again. And it's parallel. This sentence is parallel to that sentence. Another tool of rhetoric is what we call antithesis. And antithesis just is a fancy way of saying pairs of related ideas or opposites. So, um, and it's very strong often when you put these pairs of opposites against one another. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the epic of joy. It was the epic of despair. Um, opening line from uh, Tale of Two Cities, very famous. To be or not, not to be. See, so you know this one already. And it's, and it's memorable because it's this pair of antithesis. Antithesis is huge. Shakespeare uses it a ton. Shakespeare, yes, yes. Uh, uh, fiend, angelical, dove, feathered, raven, wolvish, ravening, lamb, despised its substance of divinest show, just opposite to what thou justly seemst. Uh, which is Juliet talking about um, Romeo after he kills Tybalt. Anyway, sorry. For those of you freshmen who haven't read it yet, I've just given away half of the plot. Anyway. Oh, wait, that's um, been, how, how many words are in your book? I have no idea. Didn't yeah, no, like Shakespeare have like 20,000? 30,000. 30,000. Yeah, it was huge. Yes. In any case, point being, um, you're fat. Dumb, ladies, thank you. Um, point being, uh, antithesis, these pairs of opposites are really important when you put them together. My opponent has done all of this horrible stuff. I have only done this horrible stuff. <laughs> uh, uh, we see those, those, pair, those pairs of, of opposites and comparisons a lot in rhetoric. And one more piece of rhetoric, very, very powerful, is imagery. Yay. We can paint pictures with words, and when we do, we, um, we, we basically get to, to reach inside our audience's head. We paint an image with our words, and it's, it's in there. They can't help but seeing it. And suddenly, they're on our side. They're sort of filming the video that we're talking about in their head. My opponent kicks dogs in the face. My opponent eats bananas without peeling them. My <laughs> opponent smells like sulfur and rotten eggs. Now, it doesn't matter if these things are true. Let me be smell very like clear that. about this. I'm creating powerful images in your head. And even if my opponent then comes about, it's like, I, I don't smell like, like rotten eggs. I've never eaten a banana in my life. I love dogs. Here's a picture of me loving a dog. Um, even if they come back and refute, refute that, we've already put that other image of the banana-eating, dog-kicking, uh, bad egg-smeller into the heads of our audiences. So imagery, powerful imagery, imagery that involves senses, uh, what the, the thing looks like. And this is where we get to um, the genius of, um, well, we'll get to that, um, the genius of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, because his use of imagery in that is fantastic. He talks about what the future is going to look like. Um, 
and uses other things in there. I have a, a dream that my children will grow up uh, in a land where they are judged not by their, uh, the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Again, antithesis, right? The color of their skin on one hand, content of their character on the other hand, pairs of antithesis. But painting that picture, using that imagery of what the world ought to be. So these are some things. And the great thing, as I said, is you can be talking about anything. And if you use these things, it will sound like what you're saying is significant. Um, you could be talking about something nonsensical like bananas, for example. And you could use these things. Um, I view a world where everyone is a will have bananas. The children will have bananas. <laughs> and the elderly will have bananas. And you will have bananas. <laughs> <laughs> in the morning and in the evening. At the beginning of the day and at the end of the day. You will have bananas. <laughs> Rich bananas and poor bananas. Little bananas, little bananas for the children. Little bananas for the wee, wee little ones. Little bananas for the babies. Bananas are mushy, you can feed them to babies. Uh, bananas everywhere. Bananas in your oat. Bananas for my grandma! Bananas for your grandma! <laughs> It's all nonsense, what I just said. I just happen to say it with energy, and I made use of a few things. I made use of rule three, parallelism, little antithesis, little imagery, talking about the size of your bananas, and, and that's all that we needed. Um, so quick, uh, last couple questions, and then we'll break down and take a look at some speeches and see how rhetoric is using them. Nick? Go back to your banana speech. I'm more of an apple person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm I'm an an I, sh I should have said banana the antithesis of bananas versus apples and, and the evils of apples. <laughs> apples, apples, which took us out of the Garden of Eden. It <laughs> wasn't the banana that Eve ate. Oh, no, it was the apple. The red apple. Red, the color of blood. Red, the color of evil. Like green, yes. green, the color of money. Green, the color of jealousy. Green, the color of greed. No, 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 folks, bananas. Yellow for the sun, yellow for gold, yellow for eternal life in bananas. Yellow for CJ Cruz! <laughs>